Up until now, we've just been focusing on the fundamentals of artificial intelligence. And I believe that we've actually covered all of the fundamentals that you need to know to be able to train a powerful artificial intelligence framework to solve whatever task that you are working on. Now I'm just going to focus on some of the really interesting stuff, some of the active research that is going on in the field for the last couple of videos. Uh, this is going to be a little bit more complex, so don't worry if you don't understand everything. This is more just to be a little bit of fun and I hope that you find it interesting. This video I'm going to cover image generation and before I go into some of the current methods I'm just going to explain uh, one of like the old-fashioned methods that had some success um, before moving on to generative adversarial networks which absolutely everyone is working on today. So back in the day we had these things called autoencoders. I mean, we still use autoencoders very regularly in artificial intelligence research, so it's good to know about them, but they're not used as much for image generation anymore. What's going on here? Before, we were looking uh, mostly at the encoder. So this encoder is probably very, very similar to something that you've already seen if you've watched the past videos. The, f the encoder, where we just get to this halfway stage, is exactly the same as a regular neural network that we've looked at before. It can also be a convolutional neural network, um, but all that's going on is you've got your inputs here, and then you've got your hidden layers, and then this was the output layer before. Now we are going to refer to it as a code, just so it's consistent terminology with what we're looking at, which is an encoder and a decoder framework. So before this was a feature representation, now we're just gonna to refer to it as a code, but it's the same thing. When we have this code, we're going to put it through another neural network. And again, we're gonna have these hidden layers. And finally, we're gonna have what looks very, very similar to the input layer. Uh, but it's now going to be our new output. And you can see that the output is of exactly the same format as the original input. So what is going on here? Well, firstly, I'm going to mention that we train this in a way that's called end-to-end. -end. So this isn't two separate networks, it's all one network. So when we do the forward pass, we start from this input and go all the way to the end. And then the back propagation, likewise, is going to go all the way back to the start. And what we actually do is we use a different loss function than what we've seen before because we're not doing classification on this phase, our output is now over here. So we're going to use what's called a reconstruction loss um, or something called mean squared error. And the idea is we are just trying to get this output layer to look identical to the input layer. So the more different that the output layer is from the input layer, the higher the loss function that we are going to have. So I'm going to show you an example of how this looks um, if we're working on the MNIST data set. Um, so this is a little bit more recent. Um, this was a t paper from 2017, um, but the idea is still the same, that we just take an image, we put it through a standard convolutional network, and we get this code. Um, before we've seen this 10-dimensional output representation, so the first one is going to be, um, if it's a zero, the second one is going to be one if it's a one, uh, the next one if it's a two, etc. Um, but now we have this sort of backwards convolutional network to get back to something like a two. And once we've got to that stage, if we just want to do the image generation, we can 
get rid of the first half of the network. So we completely cross that out and we just start from this code and use that to generate an image. But this comes with a very big problem, which is that because of the way that we are training the model, because it actually sees the input data set, uh, what tends to happen is that your the images you generate seem seem to be very very close to the images that it's seen in the initial data. So it's sort of memorized everything. So this is not optimal. Um, so since then, something called variational autoencoders have been proposed to give more variety. Um, so this is just uh, VAE. This was from a paper that went on archive in 2019. And you can see that you can get really, really amazing images. And there is quite a lot of variation in these. So here you've got a girl with green hair, which is quite difficult to generate because there's not many examples of that in the training data. Uh, you also have someone that's looking upwards like that, whereas most images typically would, uh, in the training data, are just forward facing. So having someone looking upwards is already quite impressive. I'm not going to go into detail with these VAEs because they're quite mathematically complex um, beyond the scope of what I want to do with this course. Uh, instead, I'm going to look into generative adversarial networks because uh, they're a little bit more simple to understand. You can see how they work and uh, they are worked on. They're probably the most popular architecture that anyone is using. There's been thousands of these papers that come out every single year. Um, it's a really hot topic of research in the field. So it's something that I thought you might be interested in. So generative adversarial networks. Uh, this is just a few examples. You've got StyleGAN, which is pretty much the state of the art. There's now a StyleGAN version two. Um, but if you've heard of the website, this person does not exist. That is using StyleGAN images um, because they're so good, as you can see here. Uh, you've also got other GANs. Uh, one example is Logan, um, but there's thousands and thousands of these. Um, with GANs as well, we have conditional GANs, uh, which allow us to take an image and perform some sort of operation on them. So the most famous is called Cycle GAN. And you can see that this is taking an image or a video of a horse and converting it into a zebra. So that's something I'm going to talk about later. So how does a generative adversarial network work? Firstly, I'm going to say that this concept in its entirety was dreamed up in the pub. And the first author, Ian Goodfellow, got drunk, went home, had an idea. Um, his, he told his friends about the idea. They said, no, this will never work. He got more drunk. Um, yeah, went home, coded it let it run overnight, woke up, and the images he had were better than anything anyone has ever seen before. So there is still some value in going to the pub and having a few beers, even if you feel you're being unproductive. So the question that was on everybody's mind when this was uh, created was, how do we make use of the discriminative power of deep networks to generate images. So in 2012, we've talked about Alex Krzyzewski using the CNN to get best performance on ImageNet. And then we had this uh, ridiculous acceleration of imp classification improvements on lots of different um, types of task, like classification, like detection, how do we use, how do we harness this classification power to generate images? And in 2014, that is when generative adversarial networks were proposed with this idea. So we're going to use uh, just a regular neural network or a generate or a convolutional neural network as a discriminator. And I'm going to call this 
D. So this discriminator is going to see uh, all the real data in your regular data sets. Um, but you also need to generate some fake data. And for that, we have one of these backwards convolutional neural networks. So now your input is going to be a, where's my pen? There it is. Uh, now your input is going to be a vector. And this vector is going to be completely random. So we're going to call this input Z. And each of these is just going to be one by one by uh, maybe this dimension is going to be 128. So you're going to sample 128 different numbers um, from a normal distribution. So you're going to somewhere between minus one and one and it's going to be on this bell curve. So most of your initial input is going to be around zero, but there's going to be some that are uh, closer to minus one and some that are closer to one. And these just form numbers on this vector um, that goes into the network. And then you'll get an image that is generated based on this initial code. Right. So once you have created some fake images, and originally these are going to look absolutely rubbish, they're going to look nothing like anything. Uh, once you've created those images, then you put them into the discriminator, and you're going to classify. And the two classes you're going to have are class 1, which is real, and class 0, which is fake. Okay, so pause the video and let me know what loss function you think that this discriminator is going to use. So hopefully uh, you've paused the video and you've worked out that we have just two classes. So we're actually going to use a binary cross entropy loss function that we talked about in lecture five to classify these images. All we're interested in is whether they're real or whether they are fake. And the discriminator is going to be um, just using that very, very simple loss function. I'll go into the generator a little bit later, but if we just focus on the discriminator, it's all it's gonna see is real data and fake data and the real data is going to have the label one, fake data is going to have the label zero, and this discriminator is just going to try and work out which are ones and which are zero. Now if we look back at the generator, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, so this generator is actually going to try and trick the discriminator. So the idea is uh, with the discriminator, you are probably going to, well, you're going to have a loss function for all the fake data. It's going to want to, maybe I can switch color. Um, I'll try this blue. No, still not good. Um, orange. So you're going to have min of, so you're going to try and minimize um, the fake images. So the fake images are G of Z. So this uh, input Z is going to go through the generator G and you're going to try and minimize D of G of Z. So once this fake image, this fake image is going to be G of Z and it's going to go through the discriminator and you want to minimize this. So remember that the correct answer for this is all going to be uh, zero. So this is going to be zero if the discriminator is good. So that's what the discriminator is trying to do. It's trying to set all of these to zero, which is the correct label. The generator to get the best performance is going to try and do the opposite. So you're going to have a max now of D, G, Z and 
what's going to happen when you train the generator is its loss function is going, all it's going to do is try and get the discriminator to make as many mistakes as possible. So it's trying to get this value to be one. So uh, the loss for the discriminator is going to be something similar, but for the real data. So it's going to try and uh, make the real data end up at uh, one. But for the fake data, it wants all the fake data to be zero. And then the loss for the generator um, is going to be just this. So I'm just going to say that this is going to, uh, the discriminator is going to loss is going to be loss of the real stuff plus uh, the loss of the fake, which is going to be this bit. And then the generator loss is going to just focus on the fake images. It never actually sees the real data. Um, and this is what makes uh, this generator so powerful and so good at generating diverse images, unlike the autoencoders, because this generator never actually sees any of the real data set. And these two actually end up playing a game. So um, the sort of idea of what's going on here is very similar to noughts and crosses. So if you start off with um, noughts and crosses, let's say you start in the middle and you are, hopefully if you're familiar with noughts and crosses, you know that you have to go with a corner. And from this point, both players are going to have a strategy that guarantees that the game ends in a draw. So this is called Perito Optimality. Neither player has a strategy. Um, neither player can improve on their strategy at this point. Um, so the obvious thing you do is, let's say you go here, and then they'll go there, you go here, they'll probably go here, and then you'll go there, and then you'll block, and then there. Okay, so like this is um, quite easy and understandable. It's just the exact same concept, except now the discriminator has only got a zero or a one to decide on, whereas the discriminator, uh, the generator has got what's essentially a massive noughts and crosses board, and it's got to fill this in with numbers between zero and 255. So if it wanted to make a number seven, um, it would make something like this, um, and then everything else would be zero. So something similar to what we've seen in the MNIST data sets. Um, but essentially, these just play this game. And the idea is neither of them will have a strategy that after a certain amount of training, neither of them will have a strategy. So the discriminate um, that can exploit the other. So the discriminator is essentially just random guessing, which I'll show a little bit later. Um, yeah, all that's happening is you're going to start off with a really, really bad discriminator at the start, and then you're also going to generate really, really bad images. So even though the stuff you have out of this generator to start off with is really rubbish, um, by the, um, the discriminator is really rubbish as well. So as the discriminator gets better, the generator gets better as well. And it's a really tricky thing to be able to judge both of these two networks to train together at the same time so that neither one gets too good. If the discriminator gets too good, then it can very easily realize that the generator, um, everything the generator creates is fake, and then it'll be pretty rubbish. Um, and generating everything because everything it tries just fails because the discriminator is too good. So you need to keep some sort of balance. Okay, so um, in a high level perspective, let's try and see what's going on here. I'm gonna switch back to red. So um, this is the training distribution of our initial data. And the blue line is going to be what the discriminator is trained to do. 
So first we have our like what we have initially, and this Z is going to get mapped into. Um, so this is the initial vector, and this gets mapped into an image X. And this is going to be the distribution of those images um, that's being overly simplified. So the discriminator is going to train one step. So first we train the discriminator. And that is then going to be this blue line. So it gets a little bit closer to... Uh, it, it, essentially, it's going to be the halfway point between the distribution that the generator has, which is going to be in green. Um, let's go for green here. So this distribution is going to be what the generator thinks the training data is. And the discriminator's optimal uh, way of um, being able to work out which is real and which is fake is actually going to be sort of halfway between uh, this distribution, these two distributions. So the discriminator isn't trying to learn this distribution. It's just trying to learn which of these is real and which is fake. So the boundary should be sort of like this um, for real, fake. And what it learns is this blue line um, to get that decision boundary. Anyway, um, after one step of the discriminator, you train the generator. And you can see that the discriminator actually back propagates into the generator because remember the generator has uh, this loss function to maximize d g of z. So when you maximize this, uh, the actual weights from the discriminator are going to inform the generator. So it's going to help with the back propagation. And this distribution actually slides back towards the real distribution of the input data, even though it's never actually seen that input data. Um, maybe this should actually be in blue just to make things clearer. Um, and then you keep doing this again and again and again, the same way, the same way we train a regular network. And eventually the discriminator will have this blue line, which is um, completely indifferent between real or fake. So every single image it sees from the generator is so realistic looking, it may as well just flip a coin to decide whether it's going to guess real or fake. It just has no idea whatsoever. And the generator itself has completely modeled the initial distribution of the data set. OK, so if you thought that was complicated, I'm now going to go into CycleGAN, which is an extension of this. And this is close to what we've already seen, where we're going from horses to zebras. So I'm going to run through this quickly because it gets even more complicated. And you don't need to understand this, but this is just to give you an idea. So we have a horse and a ze zebra. So we've got this data set of horses and the data set of zebras, and we want to convert from one to the other. What's going to happen is we're going to have one generator, which is going to go this way. And this is going to go from horses to zebras. So this I'm just going to call G1. And this is going to get so these fake images, this G1 is going to make fake images um, and they're going to get assessed by D1, which is only going to see data from the zebra data set. So this is only going to, D1 is only going to see zebras. And that's what's going to teach G1 to create a zebra. And the exact same thing is going to happen the other way. So at the same time we're training from horses to zebras, we're also going to train from zebras to horses. So now we have two additional models. We've got um, G2, and then we're going to have D2, and that's exactly the same thing. This is going to take an input 
of a zebra and it's going to output a horse and then it's going to get assessed by D2 to see if that horse is real or fake. And that's, yeah, this discriminator is what's driving, um, what's forcing this generator to turn uh, the image from a zebra to a horse. Because if this stays as a zebra, this discriminator is only going to see image from uh, the, it's only get, the discriminator is going to see horses from the real data set. So if the discriminator sees a zebra, it can just say, ah, this is fake and then move on. Um, so in this case, fake just means not a real image of a horse. Um, so if you just put a real image of a zebra, the discriminator would see it as fake. So there's one additional step now which is called cycle consistency and it's very very similar to the um, reconstruction loss we saw before but this is called cycle consistency loss and all that um, all that does is say if we have a image let's say we have an image of a horse which i'm going to call x um, so when you have x and you put it through this generator g1 so that means g1 and then you put it back through G2. So that means we've got G2 of X. Then that should look very similar to your initial input X. So extremely similar to the reconstruction loss, but instead it's just going through two generators. Um, and that's essentially all that cycle GAN is. It's two GANs that are sort of intertwined and then this additional uh, loss function that you just add on to the others. So you've got, um, this is going to be confusing, um, but you've got five loss functions now. So you've got a loss function for D1 and a loss function for G1. And then you've got a loss function for D2 and a loss function for G1. And then finally, you've got this additional thing, which is just going to be a loss function L cycle. So if that's confusing, don't worry about that. Just focus not on the maths, but on the concepts that you just go through this cycle. Uh, you have these nice generators that do what you ask them to. And as long as you can get back something similar to your initial image, once it's been through the cycle, then you're doing well. So we can have a look very quickly what this looks like. Um, so now instead of having just a vector that you generate randomly, you're going to input uh, this image. And you might add some code if you want at stages. Um, you might add some noise or some randomness, um, but it's not important. Um, in, so, in fact, CycleGAN doesn't, so you don't need to worry about that. Instead of a vector, you just have the initial input and it's going to go through there. And then hopefully you get something that looks like a zebra if your model's doing well. And this will go into your discriminator for zebras um, and also real zebras will go into this. And then you'll have um, some back propagation through there. But this image of a zebra is also going to go into the second GAN. So this is G1 or G zebra. And then this is going to be G horse. And again, you're going to get a image of a horse. And this is going to go to D horse, which is going to also see real horses. And then hopefully you also have this image here, um, which is going to go back and we're going to compare it with the initial image. And if it's good, then the loss is going to be low. If it's bad, then the loss is going to be high. 
you don't just do this in one way. So in this case, we've looked at the cycle going from horse to zebra and then from zebra to horse. Um, but you do the exact same thing the other way as well. So you have it going that way. Um, so again, this is uh, G zeb, G horse. And now it's just the other way around. So you've got G horse and G zeb. And I've just realized if anyone's colorblind, this is going to be really difficult to see because red looks the same as green. So sorry about that. Um, but it's not much different to what we've talked about in the previous slide that um, all that's going on is exactly the same thing, but you just swap the input to be a zebra and then you get a horse. And then the second one that you go through is going to be um, to get it back to a zebra. If you thought this was complicated, it can get even more complicated. Um, so this is something that I've been working on to add a style of makeup to someone's face. And um, before, actually, I should mention that um, we see here, we are training um, G Zeb, G Horse, oops, and then D Horse and D Zebra. So we've got now before it was difficult to train four, uh, before it was difficult to train two neural networks at the same time when we had a regular GAN. Now with PsychoGAN, we're training four networks at the same time. And you can extend this to, a, to train eight networks at the same time. Um, but I'm not gonna go into that because I think um, this has already got too complicated and gone on too long. Um, so you can look into my paper if you want. Uh, I also have a video on it on this YouTube channel. Um, as just a conclusion, I'm going to give you a warning. The GANs are very, very powerful, but they're very unstable in training because we have to train these two things at the same time, and if or four things at the same time, or eight things at the same time. And if one of them gets too powerful, then that causes everything else to collapse. So they're very, very unstable and they can also take a long, long time to train. Um, if you're using a big data set or you're trying to train um, very, very big images. So MNIST is not gonna take too long because it's just 28 by 28. But if you're training 1024 by 1024 images, it's gonna take a long time. So if you wanna play around with these, um, please do, um, but they can be a little bit difficult and quite frustrating sometimes. So I hope you found that interesting and I'll see you in the next video, which is going to be on transformers.